Well, hello, CCS. Um, man, it sure is quiet around here. Uh, we, we miss you uh, terribly, uh, and uh, we just can't wait for you to start filling our halls again. Uh, I know that's, that's not happening until next year, uh, and uh, you know, I know it's tough on you seniors, but we're praying for you, and, and I know this is, this is difficult, but, but um, understand that God's working in this, and, and I just wanted to share something with you uh, today. Uh, that kind of illustrates how God can work through difficult uh, times. But before we dive into uh, the sermon today, uh, and we're going to be in the book of Job, so if you want to go ahead and turn there, uh, if you have a Bible and you want to follow along, do that. Uh, but we're going to be in the book of Job uh, in just a moment. But have you ever had a, a bad day? You ever just had one of those like really bad days where maybe you can identify with the guy in this story. He received a letter from his insurance company telling him how he needed to provide more information about an accident that he had had a little while back. And here's what he wrote back. He said, I'm writing in response to your request for more information. In block number three of the accident report from, I put poor planning as the cause of my accident. You said in your letter that I should provide more fully uh, the information. And I trust that the following details will be uh, sufficient. He goes on in this letter to say, I'm a, a bricklayer by trade. On the day of my accident, I was working alone on the roof of a 10-story building. When I completed my work, I discovered I had about 500 pounds of brick left over. And rather than carry them down by hand, I decided to lower the brick uh, to the ground in a barrel by using a pulley, which fortunately was attached to the side of the building uh, at the 10th floor. I went down and I secured the rope at the ground level. And I went back up to the roof and I loaded the 500 pounds of brick into uh, the, the, uh, the barrel and uh, uh, then went back down to the ground and untied the rope and, and I held on tightly to it to ensure the slow descent of the 500 pounds of, of brick. Uh, you, you'll notice uh, in block number 11 of the accident report that I weigh 135 pounds. And so due to the surprise of me being jerked off the ground so suddenly, I lost my presence of mind and I forgot to let go of the rope. Needless to say, I proceeded up the side of the building at a rate of speed that was very, very dangerous. And somewhere in the vicinity of the fifth floor, I met the barrel coming down. And this explains my fractured skull and my broken collarbone. I continued my rapid ascent up the side of the building, not stopping until my knuckles were, uh, or my fingers were knuckled deep into the pulley that I had devised. Fortunately, by this time, I had regained my presence of mind and was able to hold tightly to the rope in spite of my pain. At approximately the same time, however, the barrel of bricks hit the ground and the bottom fell out of the barrel. Devoid of the weight of bricks, the barrel now weighed about 30 pounds. I refer you again to my weight in block number 11 of the accident report form of 135 pounds. As you might imagine, I began my rapid descent down the side of the building and somewhere in the vicinity of the fifth floor, I met that barrel coming back up again. This accounts for the two fractured ankles and the lacerations to my leg and my lower body. The second encounter with the barrel slowed me enough to loosen my injuries when I fell into the pile of bricks, and fortunately, only three of my vertebrae were cracked. I am sorry to report, however, that as I lay there on the bricks, in pain, unable to stand, watching the barrel ten stories above me dangling from the pulley, I again lost my presence of mind and let go of the rope. <laughs> Yeah, I, don't, I don't know if anybody's ever had an accident quite like that. I don't even know if that's really a true story. But life is hard. Uh, would you agree with me in that? Uh, man, it is so difficult. And I'm sure none of you have ever encountered anything like what you're going through now. Uh, but life can beat you. It, it's really difficult. And I know some of you are feeling pretty rough right now. And whenever I go through a difficult time or whenever I'm trying to share with people uh, scripture about going through a difficult time, my mind always goes to the book of Job. And Job's story is, is incredible. And I think the first thing that we need to point out in the book of Job is that the Bible says that, that Job was uh, a righteous man. 
In fact, in chapter 1, verse 1, it says, In the land of Uz, there lived a man whose name was Job, and this man was blameless and upright, and, and he feared God, and he shunned evil. So note that Job is a man who's going to suffer, not as a punishment for anything that he, he, de- he, he did. He was a model of righteousness, and he still suffered. And I think that's important for us to know, because I think what happens sometimes when we go through a difficult time, whenever we are hurting, we, we tend to ask, God, why? Why do we have to go through this? God, why are you punishing me? What have I done wrong? Why do we all have to go through this together? I think that's important for us to understand that even though Job was righteous, um, you know, he was going through a difficult time. The Bible says he's also a rich man. Verse 2, he had seven sons. He had three daughters. So he's rich in terms of of children. He owned 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels. My question is, what do you do with 3,000 camels, right? I mean, why in the world would you have 3,000 camels? But anyway, that's a whole other sermon. Uh, He had 500 yoke of oxen. He had 500 donkeys. He had a large number of servants. So Job is loaded. Uh, He is very wealthy, and he's righteous, and he didn't just care for himself. He cared for his children. He was a family man. Uh, He was a respected man, the Bible tells us. The third verse uh, says that this man was the greatest of all the men of the East. In fact, a little bit later on in the book of Job, in chapter 29, Job is looking back on what he once had. And he said, when I went to the gate of the city and I took my seat in the public square, the young men saw me and they stepped aside. Old men rose to their feet. He's saying, that's how much I was respected. And so Job's this very powerful, he's this very influential, he's this very rich man and he's upright. He's a family man. He's just a good dude. And everybody respected him. For a while, Job was the epitome of everyone. Everybody wanted to be like him. He was a guy that did nothing wrong. And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, this this just amazing catastrophe hit. And and this 180 degree reversal of his life takes place. He goes from having all of this stuff to being attacked by Satan. And Satan goes to God and says, well, God, no wonder, no wonder Job's so righteous. You pay him so well. You know, you take care of him. You put this hedge of protection around him and nothing goes wrong with his life. And verse 11 says, but, but God, and, and I, you know, the audacity of Satan to question God, but God, you stretch out your hand and you strike everything he has. And, and I, I guarantee you, he's going to curse you to his face. And the Lord said to Satan, very well, then. Everything he has is in your hand. But on the man himself, do not lay a finger. And so Satan sends a, a, a series of, of vicious attacks. Uh, verse 13, it says his riches were stolen. Um, Job had this absolutely horrendous experience financially. And I know a lot of people are, are suffering from that right now. A lot of people have lost their jobs. Their income has been uh, depleted. And uh, maybe you're in a family that that's happening to right now. Uh, Job didn't have insurance, you know. All of a sudden, he's broke. He lost it all. And then came the worst blow. All ten of his children were killed. In verse 18, uh, we we read, and and Satan wasn't finished with him. And and so Job's health is broken. And chapter 2, you know, the Lord had... Uh, had granted Satan permission to to do what he wanted, but don't lay a finger on him. Um, And then later we see that that God even allows that to happen to Job. And and I want to stop there for just a moment and say to you that going through um, difficult times, when when you're going through uh, suffering, understand that Jesus knows what it's like to suffer. Understand that he has has suffered uh, worse than we ever have, so he understands our suffering. Satan has no idea yet what that's that's like, but Jesus Jesus does, so he can identify with you. But Satan doesn't understand that. He didn't understand that he had already inflicted his most serious blow. There's nothing worse, you know. Here here here, Satan is going and asking uh, to. Uh, continue to do more harm to to Job, but he'd already done the worst that he could do. He took all ten of his children. He killed his his children. So Job's not going to wilt under physical pain. But in verse six, the Lord said to Satan, "Very well, then, he is in your hand. 
but you must spare his life. Now, th I don't know if you've ever struggled with this passage of Scripture or not, but this is, this is a little bit troubling to me because th there's a side of me that wants to say, God, uh, God, why didn't you say to Satan, you, you keep your hands off of him, Satan. You know, you took all these other things, but you keep your hands off of him. Continue to do that. I'm not going to give you permission to do that, you know. Uh, I struggle with that a little bit, but then I think, well, you know what, maybe... Maybe God puts us in really difficult situations, even like he did with Job from a health standpoint. Puts us in difficult situations. He puts us in darkness, in our darkest moment, so that our light can shine. So that our light can shine for his glory. You know, our first concern is always, it should be, what, what is best for me? That should be our first concern. You know, and instead of saying, Lord, why is this happening to me? It should be, Lord, what can I learn from this? What is best for me? You know, Satan had caused this robbery. He'd caused a lightning storm. He'd caused a range war. Cattle wrestling was going on. He had all this heartache, took his children, death, physical affliction. And that's important for us to remember because as soon as something happens, that's what we say. Is it, God, why are you letting this happen to me? What have I done wrong? But instead of asking, what have I done wrong? Maybe you ought to consider the life of Job and say, God, what have I done right that you're allowing me to go through this? Remember, Job was a righteous man. What have I done right that you are allowing Satan to attack me like this? And then we read on. Uh, Job had more problems. His wife was bitter. You know, his wife said to him, you still going to hold on to your integrity, Job? Why don't you just curse God and die? Now, we, we beat up the wife a little bit here and say, you know, how could you do that? But listen, she was grieving over the loss of 10 children, too. I mean, it wasn't just Job that had lost children. She had, too. Uh, she'd lost 10 of them. And she'd gone from riches to rags just like that. So give her a, a little bit of slack, I guess. And, and then Job's friends come along. Man, his, his friends start talking. And, and it's good to have friends there, but sometimes I know as a friend to people, I've said some dumb things. And, and I think this is what's happening here with Job's friend. They're just going on and on and on. Job, you're suffering because you're evil. You got to confess your sins. God's afflicting you because you've done something wrong in your life. And so I can imagine Job's Faith is starting to be shaken a little bit. Chapter 3, verse 1, it says, After this, and the this part of this is after his friends had left him. Here's what it said. Job opened his mouth and cursed the day of his birth. He said, May the day of my birth perish. And the night it was said, A boy is born. May that day, may it turn to darkness, is what he said. May God above not care about it. May light not shine upon it. Now, that doesn't sound like the guy at the beginning of the book that said the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. This is the same guy that is now saying, I wish I'd never been born. You know, um, I think faith uh, in times of trouble is kind of like a yo-yo, kind of like the stock market, if you will. It's up and it's down believe strongly one time and then the next time you really your faith is is challenged and it's up and down you have a hard time but look how look how God blessed Job God was patient with Job there's about 30 chapters of the friends of Job just kind of pouring out their advice not making any sense um, and if you read through that part of the book it's kind of tedious and and, and, and you see Job, he's kind of up and down, and you're up and down. You believe strongly one time, next time you don't. But, but understand that sometimes words don't help, and all the words of Job's friend didn't help, and maybe what I'm saying to you doesn't help right now. But Job himself, listen to this, he begins to demand an explanation from God. <laughs> I mean, think about this, right? Job is demanding an explanation from from God. He said, God, if I could just have an audience with you, if I could just have an audience with Jehovah, I would challenge him because God's not treating me fairly. If God would just listen to me. You know, and, and, and God sets Job straight. And I'm just kind of wrapping up this little part of it. He's saying, Job, you got to trust me. You know, I, I'm the one who made the world. I'm the one who made all of the animals. Job, can you do that? Job, how many stars have you put in the sky? 
Job, how many storms have you calmed? Job, you're just going to have to hold on to me and you're just going to have to trust me and understand that I'm going to protect you through this. And God was generous with Job. Job chapter 42, verse 10, after Job had prayed uh, for his friends, the, the Lord made him prosperous again. And notice he gave him twice as much as what he had before. Now understand, there's a healing process that's going to take place. Job was never going to be the same because there was a grieving process that had to take place. But over the course of time, God blesses Job. He gives him twice as much as he had before. Remember, he had 7,000 sheep. Now he has 14,000 sheep. He had 3,000 camels. He, I mean, what do you do with 3,000 camels? Now he's got 6,000 camels. Huh? 500 yoke of oxen. How many does he have now? He has 1,000 yoke of oxen. 500 donkeys. Now he's got 1,000 donkeys. He had 10 children. How many more children does God give Job? He gives him 10 more. You ever wonder why God didn't give him 20 children? He had 10 before. Now he gives him 20. Well, I think it's because 20 children would not have been a blessing, but that's a whole nother thing. In, in all seriousness, I, I heard one person say this. God gave him 10 more children because Job really didn't lose the 10 children he had before. They were, they were uh, transported to heaven, and, and Job would see them again in heaven one day. So he didn't really lose those 10. And so he just gave him 10 more for a total of 20. But what's the point of the story? For us, say, all right, that's a great story. Um, man, don't know if anybody's ever suffered like that, ever had to go through things like that. What's the, what's the point of the story? There's a couple lessons, uh, and I know, you know I'm probably being long-winded right now. Um, but there's a couple of lessons I think are important for us to understand, and this is, this is the first one. Being good does not exempt us from tragedy. Okay? Being good does not exempt us uh, from tragedy. The Bible says that he causes the rain to fall on the just and the unjust. He causes the, the sun to rise on the evil and on the good. See, there, there's just certain laws of nature out there um, that are operating in our world because of the fall, uh, because of the sin in, gar in, in the Garden of Eden. There's just laws of nature now that that we have to deal with and, and we have to operate with those laws of nature just like the rest of the world does. Just because we are Christian, that doesn't make us immune from the troubles of this world. We are still vulnerable to theft. We're still vulnerable to the coronavirus. We are vulnerable to injury and death just as much as anyone. I mean, think about it. Imagine what would happen if immediately when you became a Christian, God gave you special protection. You'd never have to have trouble ever again. What would that do? I think everybody would become Christian for the wrong reason. They would, they would become a Christian not out of dedication to Christ, but out of selfish motives. Yeah, I'm going to become a Christian because look at all the wonderful things I'm going to get out of it. Jesus said, in this world, you will have trouble. You're going to have trouble. He said, take heart, I've overcome that trouble. I've overcome the world. You're going to have to suffer just like the world, but take heart, I've overcome that. And then the, the next lesson I want you to understand is that genuine faith, if your faith is in Christ, you don't need to demand immediate answers from God. So I encourage you, don't give up. When you're not getting the answer that you want, God, why am I... Why am I having to go through this? Uh, why don't I get to have my graduation ceremony or prom or spring sports or finish out my senior year the way that I wanted it to? Um, man, that's, it's tough. I hate it. I hate it for you guys. But um, we, don't, we don't know those answers, and I don't think we can demand those answers. Job said, even if God slays me, even if he takes my life, I'm going to trust him. I think one of the most important lessons of Job is 
even though I don't understand why God is permitting certain things to happen, even though it doesn't make sense, even though I don't see any possible good coming out of this, I still believe that God is good. And I still believe he's got my best interest at heart. And that he loves me. And that Christ died for me. I still believe he's going to make everything right one day. Whether that's in this, this lifetime on this planet or not, I don't know. But in the end, he's going to make everything right. Right. I believe that there is a heaven. I believe that all things work together for the good, for those that love the Lord. You want to talk about an injustice. You want to talk about something that's not fair. Look at the cross. Um, no one endured suffering like Jesus did. And yet, he was willing to do that us to identify with us so that 2,000 years later when we're going through a difficult time he knows somewhat even more so really not somewhat but even more so how we feel goodness if anybody ever suffered it was it was Jesus and he didn't deserve it he didn't deserve the torture that he took on the cross and the disciples couldn't make sense of it Satan gloated over it Angels were aghast over it. Nobody understood it at the time. But then three days later, Jesus came back to life. It was an empty tomb. And they still couldn't put all the pieces of the puzzle together. But in the course of time, we realized that God took the instrument of death and he turned it around for good. He took the worst possible thing that Satan could throw at Jesus and he made it an instrument of salvation. And when you're standing at your cross, your difficult situation, maybe you can't see your empty tomb right now. So all you can do is be like our master and say, not my will, Father, but your will be done. Job 42, 16 and 17 says, After this, Job lived 140 years. He saw his sons and his son's son, even four generations. And then Job died, being full of days. And I'm confident that he's alive in heaven today. He's rejoicing in heaven today. I'm going to meet him someday. And there's going to come a time when the Bible says, those that wait upon the Lord will mount up with wings like eagles and fly. And I know this is, this is tough for you, but trust me, you're going to look back on this someday and you're going to see God's hand at work. You're going to see amazing things happen in your life. Your faith is going to become stronger through it. I promise you. And you're going to get through this and God is going to uh, refine you like, like silver He's going to um, make you shine like, like diamonds, the Bible says. So trust in that. And that. God is in control. And we'll get through this together. Let's pray. Father in heaven, uh, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the example of Job. I thank you that um, you love us and you've got our best interest in mind. Lord, help us to trust you even when it doesn't make sense, even though we're missing out on a lot of things that we would like to participate in. Lord, help us to understand none of us are suffering quite like Job did, and none of us certainly are suffering like, like Jesus did. So help us to approach our difficult situations with complete trust in you, understanding that someday we will mount up with wings as eagles. We pray this in the matchless name of your son, Jesus Christ. God bless you all. Have a wonderful day.